Good evening, everyone. My name is Darren Reesberg. I serve as the Vice President and Deputy Provost here at the University of Chicago, and I want to welcome uh, you all to the launch uh, event uh, for the university's nuclear reactions commemoration, 1942, a historic breakthrough, an uncertain future. 75 years ago, scientists at the University of Chicago achieved the first controlled, self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction, ushering in the atomic age. This momentous event took place just blocks away from here at 57th and Ellis Avenue. The Henry Moore sculpture called Nuclear Energy recognizes the site of this historic achievement. The Nuclear Reactions commemoration video, which we'll show momentarily, tells of the events leading up to the reaction on December 2nd, 1942. And the video helps underscore what was at stake and the significant collaboration required amongst the US government, scientists, and new immigrants to the United States. Our conversation today includes experts from government, academia, policy, and civic arenas, and will address the new nuclear landscape we're facing and its implications for international security. Before I introduce tonight's moderator, I turn your attention to the screen for the premiere of our nuclear reactions video. So in 1939, the world is in a desperate situation. The Nazis are on the move. They seem unstoppable. The Germans attacked Poland, Netherlands, Belgium, and the French. They were ruthless. They demonstrated their ruthlessness. They seem capable and willing to execute a war of total domination. And the United States is watching very carefully what's happening. They understood what Hitler was capable of doing. So right about this time, you have the advancement of nuclear science and physics. Everybody is on the cusp of controlling uh, nuclear energy. Several German physicists actually first demonstrated the ability to split the atom. People like Albert Einstein, people like Enrico Fermi, Leo Szilard, realized right away the potential of what that discovery could mean. Suddenly, Germany stops the export of Czechoslovakian uranium, which makes scientists in the United States and the rest of Europe very nervous about what Germany's up to. The scientists convinced Einstein to write the letter to FDR. Warning him that if the Germans were able to develop that discovery, it could actually lead to building one of the most powerful bombs ever built. FDR's response to the letter was remarkably uh, prompt. Funding begins to be put into nuclear research. The world's greatest scientists are fleeing Europe, and they're coming to the United States for safety. And then as the Manhattan Project becomes established, they come to the University of Chicago and they begin to build the pile under stag fuel. There was a squash court. It was a heady environment. You had the world's best physicists about to unleash nuclear power. They're also thinking about the implications of what it will mean being used for the destruction of humanity and not for peaceful purposes. The pace was fast. They were working against the Germans. They literally believed it was hour by hour, day by day. They might be behind. They didn't work 40 hour weeks. They worked two 12 hour shifts every day. This was going on 24 seven for two weeks. They understood what was at stake. They understood that civilization in the Western world was at stake. The first step was to acquire the materials. Fermi begins to understand that if they build a reactor with very pure graphite, they will get the reaction that they're looking for. The amount was huge, 45,000 bricks, each brick weighing almost 20 pounds. They're stacking these graphite blocks that are incredibly heavy. They've got day laborers who are helping them with it. They were using uranium. The uranium came in two forms, uh, one metallic uranium, and the other uranium oxide. This was the cutting edge, the bleeding edge of science, and it was happening here. What is really quite amazing is the short duration during which the pile was actually assembled. It was a matter of days where they built that reactor. 15 days, specifically. The group felt the weight of the country, if not the world, on their shoulders. The politicians, FDR included, really did not understand the, the nature of the beast that they were funding. Those in the room understood that they were on the cusp of a revolutionary change in energy. They had just finished building Chicago Pile One the day before, literally December 1st, 1942, and Enrico Fermi declared next morning they would start the actual experiment. On December 2nd, 1942, Fermi and his team 
we're able to control and sustain a nuclear chain reaction. A monumental physics achievement. It would not be too much to say this was almost as important as the discovery of fire. It actually wasn't clear what it meant. They didn't know if they'd be able to weaponize it. And they didn't know if the Germans had already weaponized it. But the fact that they could control the chain reaction meant it was possible. Arthur Holly Compton really drove it as the lead scientist. He didn't do it alone. He did it with dozens and dozens of scientists. And they built, as Einstein would say, on the shoulders of giants. It was really, in many ways, the first time big science was done. And these big efforts are both exciting and dangerous. They have enormous implications for good and for evil. And it's really up to us to figure out how to manage the risks so that we can reap the benefits. I would now like to introduce our moderator for this evening's conversation, Rachel Bronson, who is the executive director and publisher of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, where she oversees the publishing programs, the management of the Doomsday Clock, and a growing set of activities around nuclear weapons, nuclear energy, climate change, and emerging technologies. Rachel is also a member of the Nuclear Reactions Planning Committee, which has been working since February to produce this autumn's commemoration programming. And I want to thank all of the members who are here tonight. So I invite Rachel and the panelists now to come to the stage. Uh, Rachel will introduce the panelists. And I thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, thank you for coming out and joining us on a uh, Sunday evening. I want to also thank Darren Reisberg and his team um, at the University of Chicago for what's going to be a really tremendous semester. And I hope many of you in the audience will join us for many of the activities that we have planned. Um, I thought what we would do is very quickly um, kick off. And we'll do that by, I'll introduce the panelists to you. We are so fortunate to have this amazing group with us and set the scene a little bit of where we are today compared to where the video led off, left off, and then begin our conversation. So let me start with Mike Morell here to my left. Mike has uh, twice been acting director of the CIA, and he served as, um, uh, as the deputy director for the CIA for some time. Mike's one of the foremost thinkers on national security. He's won just about every um, award and medal that you can win, um, both from the CIA and for his distinguished service in helping us catch bin Laden. He has, is one of, he's the, one of the only people, he's the only person who was both with President Bush um, when the two towers went down on September 11th, as well as when bin Laden was captured and is, cre is credited with the intelligence portion of that. So we're really thankful to have him. He serves now on many uh, boards, and I know him, and many of you might know him, as serving on the advisory board of CPOST here at the University of Chicago, the Chicago Project on Security and Terrorism. Congressman Foster, thank you for joining us. Bill Foster is a Democrat from the 11th District. Um, he's the only scientist and PhD, I believe, in Congress. Um, Bill has um, uh, served very reputably at Fermilab, where he um, and his uh, team uh, discovered the heaviest matter in existence. The top quark. The top quark. Um, and in his role in Congress really represents us all quite well and the uh, scientific implications of some of the things we'll talk about, particularly the Iran deal. And some of you might remember when he came out for the Iran deal, Secretary of Energy Moniz was standing behind him when he did that. And many on the Hill looked to him as a real thought leader because he could understand the scientific implications of the deal in a way that perhaps they couldn't. Bob Rosner, I'm delighted um, to say is a, a partner in arms with me, our partner in crime. I don't know which one's worse or better. Um, but he serves as the co-chair of the Science and Security Board at the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. He's also the William E. Rather Professor of, of Astronomy, Astrophysics, and Physics, as well as uh, Fermilab and the Harris School of Public Policy. And he's the founder director of EPIC, the Energy Policy Institute at Chicago, um, is one of the um, leading thinkers on the kind of scientific implications around next generation of our energy landscape. So today, we have in front of us really three people who can help us understand what this new nuclear landscape is and what the implications are for the future. So what I thought I would do is just very quickly um, set the landscape, because it's very easy to think about uh, nuclear politics as something that's relegated to the dustbin of history. The news, the headlines these days actually help bring us up to the present to realize how terrifying it is. 
Um, but just to lay uh, the landscape, there's fewer, indisputably fewer nuclear warheads now than there were during the height of, of the Cold War. So in many ways, that's a really good news story. We've gone from about 70,000 nuclear warheads to less than 10,000. So real work has been done over the last uh, 20, 25 years since the end of the Cold War to make sure that, that, we, that we don't have to deal with as many warheads. So that's the good news. Um, the list of bad news is, is pretty long and lengthy, and I'll try to keep it um, sh uh, short. But n no longer is it just the US and the Soviet Union or the, the, the known nuclear states, right? We've had the US, so Soviet Union now, Russia, um, France, Britain, um, China. We know uh, Israel has its uh, nuclear program, but now, of course, we have India and Pakistan and, of course, North Korea. So more countries have it. We also know that non-state actors want it. So there's a concerted effort to try to, uh, to secure nuclear materials from non-state actors or terrorist groups. We also know that the arms control architecture is deteriorating. Um, it's not keeping up with the challenges that we face, and that's something that I hope we'll get into tonight. So trying to lay that landscape out, let me um, turn over, turn this to our panelists now and, and, um, and a question really um, for each of you. Mike, let me start with you. I just kind of laid a landscape out um, that's, that's pretty grim and it's, it's um, pretty demanding of, of the intelligence community both to know what's happening and to, to kind of think about what the response is. You've mentioned that you think that today is as dangerous in certain areas as the days of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is pretty terrifying. So it's an effort to kind of bring us from then up into now. Can you talk about what you mean by that and how you kind of think about this kind of changing landscape as we know it? Sure, and uh, let me just say it's great to be here and, and be part of this, so, so thank you very much for the invitation. Um, when I said that, I was specifically talking about North Korea um, and the situation that we find ourselves in uh, with regard to North Korea. Um, and the, the fundamental problem, as, as, as you all know, is, is that North Korea is within a few months, um, six to 12 months of, of, from most people's calculations, of being able to demonstrate putting a U.S. city at risk of nuclear attack. Um, and we have the President of the United States saying uh, that he will not allow that to happen, um, hence the, the crisis we're in. Um, and, in, 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 in a lot of ways, it's very similar to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, a very good friend of mine, Graham Allison um, at Harvard, who is, who is the expert on the Cuban Missile Crisis, the history of it, and the policy making around it, um, has called this a slow-moving Cuban Missile Crisis. So that's what I was referring to. Um, you know, that's, that, that, that's the bad news story. I, I think there is a good news story, and that's Iran. Our ability to, to put Iran in a box um, for at least the next 10 to 15 years. So there are there are ways to successfully manage these. We haven't succeeded with North Korea, but that's what I was referring to. Mm -hmm. And Bob, that's a perfect segue into you. You're just back from South Korea within the last few days, and you were talking to them pretty extensively about it. What does the current situation look like uh, if you're sitting in Seoul? So uh, I came back uh, on Wednesday and. Um, uh, maybe a, a w one way of describing the situation there, how people view it, is uh, to describe the front page of the Korea Times on Wednesday. <clears throat> so it had three stories. Uh, the lead above the fold uh, had to do with uh, the possible conflict, armed conflict between the United States and uh, North Korea. Um, a story about reducing uh, fine dust. And then below the fold was an article on the, uh, about the fact that uh, the U.S. is sending a, a nuclear carrier, uh, the uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, at the end of this month offshore uh, Korea. And when you talk to people, it, it's clear what's uppermost on their mind. They're very nervous and unusual compared to the past. They're nervous about us. I think that's a, a distinct difference from what I experienced in previous trips to, to, to South Korea. They're really worried about us. And um, before we get to Bill, I, it might be interesting for the audience to know why you went to Korea, because you were going there to talk about civilian nuclear energy, was right. that right, and some changes right. there. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about that so we can, f we can start filling in some of the contours of... Okay. So um, South Korea has been one of the uh, major suppliers of, on the international market of uh, nuclear reactors, light water reactors. For example, they are currently building four 
light water reactors in Abu Dhabi, one of the Emirates. Um, so uh, historically speaking, uh, they have been uh, proponents of nuclear power. Uh, the governments that have supported it typically have been on the conservative side. And the last conservative premier left under a bit of a cloud, I'd say, uh, President Park, uh, just a year ago. And uh, her replacement is someone who is uh, from um, uh, the so-called Democratic Party, which is left-leaning, left-center, I would say, and quite anti-nuclear. So the, the uh, workshop that I attended was an international conference on the nuclear fuel cycle. And um, uh, the conference was originally organized before this turnover in parties and governing parties. And I think it was originally intended to be a bit of a celebration of uh, South Korean prowess in things nuclear. And instead, what it's turned out to be is a bit of a, a dirge for nuclear power, because this government, the current government, has said that they want to get out of nuclear. They are not going to build any more nuclear power plants in South Korea. And uh, they will not allow life extensions of the existing plants. So basically, it really means uh, it's the end of the story. Now, whether or not that will stick is, is a good question. Another election, another party comes in. So you never really know. But certainly the mood on, uh, on things nuclear has really dramatically changed in South Korea. Congressman Foster, I know that you have been um, very concerned uh, or very focused on the need to um, try to get research reactors to convert from highly enriched uranium to low enriched uranium. And I'm wondering if you can talk about what's happening in that context in the larger context of terrorism, that uh, fear of terrorism can often drive those concerns. And so maybe through that you sure. can help. Well, I guess I should start by just uh, saying um, that there's a, not all enriched uranium is created equal. Uh, the degree of enrichment is crucial. Um, once you go above about 20 percent, it's a soft number, but roughly 20 percent, um, you can make a nuclear weapon out of it. Less than that, it gets exponentially more difficult. And so uh, for that reason, um, if you have a reactor uh, based on low enriched uranium, 20% or below, it's almost useless to terrorists. You can, you can grab the uranium out of that and you have to further enrich it, which means you have to get centrifuges and everything. It means you pretty much have to be a nation state to do it, not a terrorist group. And so there's a, just a qualitative difference. Um, at the end of the Cold War, there were oh, just several dozens of countries that had small research reactors with high enriched uranium up to 90%, and that, uh, it turns out, is very easy to turn into a, a nuclear weapon. Um, be you just a simple gun-type device. I remember hearing a lecture on this from a gentleman sitting in the row there. Hi, Henry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who's got some uh, family genetics on that whole, the whole business. But it's, um, but this is a, um, so this is a really important thing, and it's actually one of the triumphs since the Cold War, is that we've reduced by, I think, 30 different, 30 countries who used to have a stock, some device with high enriched uranium, no longer has. It's been replaced, and there's a very, um, very aggressive program to refurbish the reactors with low enriched uranium. Now, this became a big issue in the Iran nuclear negotiations, where at some point Iran agreed, okay, we will never make a nuclear weapon, and then, um, and then according to Ernie Money, is my source on this, they said, okay, why don't you agree then never to enrich past 20%? At which point their answer was no. Uh, we, we have the right under the Non-Proliferation Treaty to enrich arbitrarily high, and we intend to use that for our nuclear submarines just like you do. Uh, which, you know, by the letter of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, they have the right to do it. And so then the question arises, why does anyone? Not everyone does. The French, for example, have a very successful nuclear program that does not rely on, on high enriched uranium. And so one of the things I've been working on in Congress is to see if the United States can make a transition to using only low enriched uranium on its carriers and, and nuclear submarines as well, which is technically non-trivial. Um, there will be compromises in the design, but it's one of the things where um, even if there's a small compromise in the performance, it makes the world such a safer place. Then you can think about going forward and saying, uh, coming up with a new version of the Non-Proliferation Treaty that um, says that all people who claim they're never going to make a nuclear device, a nuclear bomb, will also agree never to enrich past 20%, which it turns out is technically uh, 
relatively easy thing to enforce or to detect a violation of. Because if you find even a microscopic amount of high enriched uranium in a country that claims they're never enriching past 20%, you know they're cheating. Mike, before we move to some of the, the U.S. responses to what we're seeing, I thought it might be useful for you to talk through, are, are some of these challenges more difficult than they were uh, during the Cold War, less difficult? How do you try to um, kind of organize intelligence gathering to begin to deal with this changed environment? So there's two, there's two issues, right? One is um, getting inside of a nation state that, that you want to know what they're doing. Um, it's not trivial um, at all. It's particularly not trivial when you're talking about a country like North Korea that is, that is sealed um, from medically. Um, dip, you know, we don't have a diplomatic presence. Um, there aren't U.S. businesses uh, going in and out, U.S. businessmen going in and out. Um, so it is very difficult uh, to, to, to get your hands on, um, to get your arms around. Um, and then the second, the second is non-state actors. So you mentioned that terrorists um, would like to get their hands on a nuclear weapon. A absolutely, they've said so publicly. We know that they've actually pursued that. Um, and then there's, there's the, the, the supply side, right? There's the loose nuclear material, um, possibly in Russia, possibly in other places, um, that you have to keep track of, right? So, so the, 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 the state is a problem because it's difficult to get at, and the, the non-state's a problem because um, you don't even know where they are half the time. So it's, a, it's quite a challenge, um, it's not easy, um, but the president should have an expectation that his or her intelligence community should be able to, uh, should be able to do those things. And, and the fact that it's hard should be no excuse. So the, the U.S. finds itself at, at this moment where um, we have some big choices to make. Um, and Bob, maybe this, this will go to you to kind of start us talking about the U.S. modernization program that's underway. The U.S. is about to, on the cusp of investing, the numbers are about a trillion dollars over 30 years. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about this and, and maybe address your concerns about new tests that we might have to undertake and why that would be important if we move forward with the plans that we're seeing. So the, uh, the, the modernization program really has its roots in two separate issues. Um, one has to do with the fact that while the United States participated in uh, the negotiations for the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, uh, the Senate never ratified it. So, uh, the question is, how did we behave? And the way we behaved is as if we had ratified it. And this has been true for both Democratic and Republican administrations. We simply stopped testing. So when you do that, the obvious question comes up. Uh, the president says at some point, which I, we all hope never, will never happen, uh, push the button, the button gets pushed, and the weapons don't work. So the way that, uh, that issue was traditionally addressed is, um, uh, the Department of Energy would withdraw from the stockpile, existing stockpile, um, weapons at random, would bring them to the Nevada test site, would bury them, blow them up, and uh, monitor performance. And uh, as of uh, the period when the we, we, you know, we started to behave as if we had ratified the, the treaty, uh, we could no longer do that. So the obvious question is, how do you know that uh, these things work? So one of the consequences of that, uh, that answering that question is the so-called uh, stockpile stewardship program. It's a science-based stockpile stewardship program. And the essence of that was to use simulations uh, in order to uh, validate uh, statements that were made about the performance of these weapons. Now, it turns out there's another reason for uh, doing this sort of thing. And that has to do with the fact that it, uh, it was well known in the department and in the Department of Energy as well as the Air Force that uh, these weapons age, components age. There are certain parts that age more rapidly than others. They have to be replaced. So there is, in fact, an ongoing inspection program of all weapons. Um, they're opened up, they're taken a look at. Things that are not working are fixed. Sometimes the things that are fixed are different from the original construction and therefore, the, again, the question comes up, when you replace parts with different parts, 
that made differently, for example, uh, how do you know it will work? So that's another justification for this uh, science-based stockpile stewardship program. So the, the, what has happened is, the, the first thing that happened is that there has been an ongoing um, refurbishment program of the existing stockpile that probably dates back to, uh, I'm guessing, the end of the uh, Clinton administration, certainly was done during uh, the, the two terms of the Bush administration, it's still ongoing today. Um, the second issue has to do with, um, do we modernize our production facilities? That is, I think, what you're actually asking about. So uh, depending on how you uh, view the size of our stockpile, uh, if the stockpile eventually will go down to sizes of, say, some folks have argued that 500 warheads that are on duty, that are deployed, would be enough for, say, the United States, uh, then you could afford to have um, production facilities that are nowhere near the capability of the uh, stock, the production facilities that we used to have. Um, but others are worried that maybe that's not enough. The, the bottom line is that actually, starting in the Bush administration, we have actually started to modernize the production facilities as well. So for example, what, the Y-12 plant in uh, Tennessee, Oak Ridge, has been completely rebuilt. The Kansas City plant is being rebuilt, and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, we're in the process of basically rebuilding the entire production complex, and that's largely, I think, done. The next step is, are we going to renew the delivery vehicles? Oh, you, know, you can basically go through the entire inventory of what exists in the nuclear system and uh, ask, are we going to rebuild everything? And the proposal under the Obama administration was basically to do that. And that's the trillion dollars that you're talking about. I think many people are guessing that it's not a trillion, that maybe it's just a bit more. Um, <laughs> so let me, let me turn that over to uh, Congressman Foster on this. First of all, do you think there's um, an appetite for supporting that kind of investment? And what's the discussion on, on the Hill for um, move going forward with a modernization that seems beyond refurbishment? Um, it has the potential to create a new nuclear arsenal as some people worry about. Well, do you mean new capabilities or just mm -hmm. replicating our existing? New, cap new capabilities. Well, it's, you know, it's unfortunately become a very partisan issue. Uh, it's, it's one of the tragedies in this, and that both, uh, both you know, nuclear weapons generally and particularly ballistic missile defense um, are just, you know, there, there's this whole legend out there about, you know, Ronald Reagan, you know, defeated the Soviet Union with Star Wars. And this has embedded itself very strongly in one of the two political parties in our country as something, a myth that cannot be questioned. Mm -hmm. And this is, um, it makes it very hard for many members of Congress to vote you know, you know, to vote against this. Uh, you know, it also has the usual, um, the, you know, pork aspects of it. A lot of this money is spent and provides thousands of jobs in certain congressional districts, th certain states, and they're very dedicated to this irrespective of its merits, and so you have to swim against that tide. Uh, during the, the floor debate on this uh, a couple years ago now, um, you know, I asked my, my colleague on the other side of the aisle what, um, if he could name, we're talking about the need to have a capability to manufacture an enormous number, you know, back to Cold War levels if we ever had to. And so I I asked them without getting a response if there was if they could give me a list of nations that are not um, that are insufficiently intimidated by our existing number of of weapons and that may be more intimidated and they couldn't come up with a very extensive list <laughs> um, and this is a you know it, but it's a real problem the sort of mythology that's gone um, you know I also frankly feel kind of lonely when I entered Congress I was the third PhD physicist in the U.S. Congress. Uh, there was a bipartisan um, a group that included Vern Ehlers, who passed away recently, a very, very thoughtful. He was a nuclear physicist who'd somehow come out of Berkeley in the 1960s as a Republican. And, um, <laughs> but, but he was a very, very thoughtful guy, and, and he demanded a science-based uh, you know, approach to things like missile defense, of which he was not a fan, and spent a lot of time trying to convince his, his Republican colleagues. But you know, Rush Holt was.
was the other one, a plasma physicist from, from Princeton, and you know, one by one, the other two retired. And so it, it's tough because you know, during the Iran nuclear deal, you know, there was a page of the, the Iran nuclear agreement that was a set of reactor core specifications for what the changes that had to be made um, in the heavy water reactor so it could not be used to make large amounts of weapons grade plutonium. And you know, members, you know, Democrats and Republicans would come up to me and say, what the heck does this mean? And you know, I explained it as best I could, but realized there weren't enough of me there to really, you need this aggregate knowledge that, um, that sort of has dissipated since the Cold War. And it's a big problem. You have the staff whose size has also been reduced. When Newt Gingrich came in, he reduced a lot of the sizes of staff. And so there's a lot of knowledge that's been lost there as well. Um, the Office of Technology Assessment, another key element of scientific expertise, was vaporized in the Gingrich Revolution. And it's, it's one of the only things that decisions that has not been reversed. And so you know, there's, a, there's a problem there, because these are dip, deeply technical. I, concepts, and there just isn't enough aggregate expertise in Congress. But stay, staying on, and I think just to wrap it back up to nuclear reactions, I know one of the, the goals that um, of, of, of kind of this initiative is to really kind of think through what, um, what, is, the, what is sciences and scientists' responsibility in kind of engaging with the public, and what's all of our responsibility in engaging with the public. And, the um, video got at this, but I think it speaks to the need for all of us with bringing different talents to serve in in a uh, public role as you're doing. Um, I do want, before we go to Mike, I do want to just stay a little bit on ballistic missile defense because I know it's something you're thinking about a lot now and you're kind of concerned with um, how we're talking about in terms of our response to the current situation in North Korea because clearly I think we'd all feel uh, it seems like we should all feel a lot safer if we were able to shoot these things down. And what's your take on that? Well, you know, during during the the Star Wars time, during the Reagan administration, and after, you know, it became obvious, I think, uh, really, you know, to everyone that we didn't have a chance of making a missile defense system against a full scale attack from the Soviet Union. That you could just dwarf, you know, just. Um, that you'd launch so many missiles that you'd have to have a, such a reliable system that it was not feasible, even if you could make it work against a single incoming missile. At this point, the proponents of the system said, oh, well, it's not designed to take out a whole you know, enormous number of incoming Soviet missiles, but how about one or two missiles from rogue states? And that, for the last 20 years, has been the, the and so now we have you know, one rogue state with arguably one or a small handful of missiles. And so it had better work now after all this money. And the, the difficulty is that they, that's pretty much what they told us in, in, a, in a pretty much classified briefing. They said, you know, we have a significant, they showed us, you know, of all of their tests, they finally got one that worked. And they showed us the, all of the video readout of that one test that worked. Okay, but if you look at the fraction of tests that have worked, um, and so that's problem number one. You know, it's, it's well less than 50%, you know, if you just look at the measured number. But you know, the other problem is that um, if you look at all of the countermeasures that have been talked about publicly, of which there are probably a couple dozen, uh, this has been tested against essentially none of them. Um, you know, even Clu has it been tested against what? Uh, essentially none of them, you know, without getting into the numbers. But there are, there are a large number of fairly obvious countermeasures that a relatively low-tech country um, could deploy. Uh, that would that we have not tested our system against, and this is and the danger, the real danger here is that they will tell President Trump, not known as a, a technical expert, that oh yes we have a solid. Don't worry about their missile. We have a solid miss, ballistic missile defense. That is the single most dangerous thing that could happen, and based on what they told us in Congress, um, you know I'm I'm not convinced that they're not telling him that. And that's a huge. Huge danger. Can I add a point here? Absolutely. Um, I agree 100% with that. Um, and I would add that we're not just dealing with, with North Korea firing one missile. Um, they're capable of firing more than one missile at a time. Um, you'll remember a couple of months ago, they fired four yes. at a time. That was a message to us about yes. missile defense. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And one of, one of the tough things about missile defense are the economics of it. You can, it is much cheaper to just swamp Something. Also, we, we have to come up with a missile defense system that works in defense of South Korea and Japan. And they have, you know, nuclear-capable short-range missiles and have had for some period of time. And that's, um, 
you know, and you don't have to solve the reentry problem and stuff like that for certain kinds of short range missiles. So it's, you know, there's a danger there that we're, we're sort of looking only at ballistic missile defense, you know, without even mentioning the whole problem of smuggled nuclear weapons. You know, you know, Robert Oppenheimer sort of famously said under questioning from a member of Congress, he said, well, you know, isn't it possible for the Russians to sneak a nuclear weapon into New York? Um, and they go, yeah, they can do that. Pretty much anyone who has one can. Well, how do we, how do we detect that? And he said, well, with a screwdriver meaning that you pry open every suitcase and you unscrew every, um, every container coming in. And you know, the truth of the matter is, you know, there are, it is not hard to shield things that make it very hard to detect. Uh, and, former, former Secretary of Defense, Bill Perry, has created this whole video where that's what keeps him up at night, that notion of sm <laughs> smuggling and of, of a weapon that could be detonated in, in a city. Mike, I want to come to you with your thoughts about that, about how we begin to prepare ourselves and how we've been doing and how we've been preparing ourselves over, over the last um, number of years. Before I do, I was remiss at the beginning. There will be University of Chicago students and staff walking around. I think you, I think you got question cards. If you have questions, I see a few on the side. You can lift up their cards and we'll get those uh, just in a few minutes. Um, so, uh, Mike, that's kind of a, a segue in this, this breakdown between domestic and international that, that has been occurring um, in how we think about security. Can you talk a little bit about that, of how we've been, what, you know, have we been doing a good job in trying to respond to that? You know, I think, I, I think post 9-11, um, um, the concerns about terrorists being able to come to the United States and conduct an attack. Um, along with what we knew was Al-Qaeda's interest in nuclear weapons. Um, there was, post 9-11, an intense focus on, on not only monitoring what they were doing, um, but also preparing here at home to both detect and respond. Um, so there was an awful lot of work that the executive branch did um, post 9-11 um, that I th think was good work. Uh, um, and, and the technology for detection has advanced significantly over the last 15 years, um, and that's a good thing. Um, but there shouldn't, be, there shouldn't be anybody who thinks that the risk has been fully mitigated. Um, this, this, this is still a, a, a very serious issue, um, and I think it actually probably deserves a little bit more attention than, than it's getting today. Um, I think some of the attention has dwindled away as Al Qaeda was was undermined um, in Pakistan and Afghanistan, and as it became increasingly clear that that Al Qaeda was having a difficult time sending people here to conduct attacks, right? We made that so much more difficult, um, and I think there's 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 less attention today than there was in 2003, 2004, 2005, and I think probably some of that attention needs to come back given the, the, the risk that we now face to that from nation states. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm mindful of time, and I want to make sure we have enough time to spend on the Iran deal, which has been a huge um, issue domestically. And we have the president um, saying that, he'll, that he's made his decision to, recertify, to certify whether Iran is in compliance in the next two weeks. And he just hasn't told us what those answers are. So this is really an uh, uh, important topic for us. Um, Mike, maybe I can start with you then, um, just uh, given where we finished off. What are you hearing from our Iran from Iranians and our allies about kind of their views of how the Iran deal is is going, whether or not Iran is compliant, and how do they want to see us manage our response? Yeah, let me let me just step back a little bit further mm -hmm. and say, with regard to Iran, there's there's. Um, two buckets of issues. The first bucket is the Iranian nuclear weapons program, um, which, I said, which as I said earlier, as a result of the Iran nuclear deal, as a result of the JCPOA, that is in the box. It's in the box both um, from what they can do at their declared facilities, but it's also in the box from what they can do covertly. That's, that's this great strength of this deal. And they're in the box for the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, there'll be some aspects of the deal that expire in 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, but some of the aspects of the deal will never expire. Um, do we, do we, will we need to think about 
extending this, some of those restrictions at some point, yes, we will. But right now, they're in the box. And I would think, and this is my own view now, I would think that the last thing we want to do right now is reopen that issue. Um, do we want a nuclear crisis with Iran at the very same time that we're dealing with a nuclear crisis with, with, with uh, North Korea? Um, so that's, that's bucket one. Bucket two is all of the bad things that Iran does around the world in the, in, in the region. Their own terrorism, support to terrorism, support to insurgents, um, their desire that the state of Israel be wiped off the face of the planet. There's a whole bunch of stuff, right, that the Iranians do that we don't like. Um, and, and what do we do about that? And then across the top of the whole thing are the most interesting politics in Iran that we've seen in a very, very, very long time. And that is a real struggle inside of Iran for the future direction of that country between whether or not it's going to remain a revolutionary state or become a normal state. And as we manage the nuclear issue, and as we manage the regional misbehavior issue, we have to make sure that we don't, in the process of managing those two things, strengthen the hardliners and weaken the moderates. The one thing that we would guarantee do if we you know, walked away from the nuclear deal is strengthen the hardliners and weaken the moderates. And to get to your point, we would separate ourselves from our allies. Nobody would be with us. We would be all by ourselves. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of my view on this. Um, I think it would be a, a, a strategic mistake of historic proportion to walk away from this deal. And, and last point is the Iranians are largely in compliance with the deal. They are fully in compliance with the large pieces and most important pieces of the deal. They are lagging in compliance on some minor things. But on the most important things, they are in compliance. So um, a congressman sitting on the Hill, you're clearly hearing some different things from your colleagues. But what we are seeing from uh, news reports is that there's a, there's grow, a growing bipartisan interest. And I don't know how significant that is in uh, trying to get the president to certify that Iran is in compliance. This is gonna occupy, I assume, the next couple weeks of your attention. Is there anything you can tell us from the Hill about where this is going and maybe the implications of it? Well, the biggest problem is that there's, there's a lot of desire, particularly on the other side of the aisle, to somehow merge the two buckets of issues together. And the, the asymmetry that makes that not feasible is that there, the reason the Iran nuclear deal worked is that you had a unanimity of superpowers that we should stop this from happening. You know, you had, that's why you had China and Russia, and, as well as the EU, um, in on, on the sanctions against them. Uh, but there is not that unanimity against all of the other you know, terrorism support and stuff like that. For example, Russia is perfectly okay with what Iran is doing in Syria for example. And so there is not the possibility of having sanctions, you know, those, those side of, you know, inclusive sanctions that we had for the nuclear only deal. And that's something that opponents of the deal never have honestly faced up to, that, that real asymmetry. Mm -hmm. And are you, so are you seeing any of, are you seeing a bipartisan group emerging, or is it still pretty fractured it's, and everyone's is, waiting to see? Yeah, everyone's sort of crossing their fingers and hoping that um, uh, the president finds some reason to, you know, because if it gets thrown back in, it, it's just become so partisan uh, that, you know, this is, this is seen with a lens that's not too different than let's destroy President Obama's legacy by, by a significant block of, of members of Congress, and it's it's sad, but ignoring that reality is not wise. So I think the stakes are extremely high. Yeah. Bob, one of the things that I found so interesting during the Iran deal itself was the role of the labs. And I remember a, a story that David Sanger had, and it was the bottom, front page below the fold about the role that the nuclear labs were playing in terms of, of um, either pushing back to say, these restrictions aren't tight enough, 
or and actually testing out and kind of recreated um, a simulation of the Iranian labs. Um, what role did did the labs play? Um, as you know, you're, you're very close to the labs. So, what roles that you can talk about have they played, and what roles can they continue to play um, in terms of some of this um, verification in terms of mm -hmm. compliance? Right. <clears throat> so the, the last po uh, question that you asked, the verification issue, is exactly where the labs have played a major role. Um, one of the provisions in the agreement is that the Iranians um, get a warning, uh, warning period that inspectors will show up. So inspectors can't just show up un uh, unannounced. And so the question, the obvious question is, uh, is it possible for, uh, for the Iranians to basically scrub their facilities? So they have a program, an illicit program, they scrub it, and could they hide it? And this is, this is a, clearly a major issue. And one of the things that the labs helped uh, really clarify is that basically you can't scrub enough. They can't really hide it. You have something like 20 days, and you, in 20 days you cannot clean it up enough. So if there is illicit activity, they, uh, it will be found. And the labs uh, have been, uh, uh, have been uh, a mainstay in developing the technology for detection. Uh, this this is, has been a major issue. And one of the re really interesting questions for the future is, uh, could you do detection standoff, where you don't have to go and visit the sites? Could you do it from afar? So this, this is something that, if it can be done reliably, would be a huge, huge advantage. The labs were just spectacular. Uh, during, I think during the um, run-up to the vote in Congress, um, I think I had more than a dozen classified briefings, many of them individual briefings with the lab scientists that uh, supported the negotiations. And uh, for example, one of the major uh, representations the administration made about it was the one-year breakout time. Right. That if uh, Iran at some point said, we're forget it, kick out the inspectors, we're just going to go and make weapons as fast as we can, that we had one year between the time they kicked out the inspectors and the time that they had their hands on the first nuclear weapons worth of material. And so, in to evaluate that one-year breakout time, which is a question I got asked a lot by other members of Congress. Um, did I believe that one-year breakout time? You know, you have to look down every possible path to a nuclear weapon, of which, unfortunately, there are very many. You know, both plutonium, you know, they have a, a conventional light water reactor that at certain times in the fuel cycle has a tremendous amount of weapons usable plutonium in it. And, and there's various, you know, documents out there in, in cyberspace on you know, on ways that have been contemplated to very rapidly reprocess stuff. And so, you know, the, that's one of many examples of, of paths you have to evaluate. And I was really impressed when I went to the labs and they said, okay, well, first off, the answer is no, and here's why. And secondly, here's a white paper that we can get you at some subsequent briefing if you want to know the details. And just the, the level to which Ernie Moniz had engaged the labs you know, made, when you see government really working well, uh, you should give them a pat on the back. So that's what this is. Yes. Can I just give Ernie Moniz a pat on the back? Yes. You know, I think this deal um, ended up being as strong as it is because Ernie was at the negotiating table. Yes. Um, and, and both as, as the Secretary of Energy and institutional knowledge that that brought, but as the person, Ernie Moniz, I think it was huge. So I think we're about to turn for the, some, some questions coming up. Maybe um, as they come up, since we've got a room full of students, is there anything that you would like to tell those students in terms of these big questions of, well, what do we do, right? What do we do about kind of the things we've been talking about? We have scientists, a, a congressman, and an intel analyst here. Um, what advice would you have for the audience here in terms of areas that if they pursued now, could actually be very helpful to some of the discussions that we've had. Number one, get a PhD. Number two, run for the U.S. Congress. <laughs> I was going to say get a PhD and come to the CIA. <laughs> I would say just get informed. So the first, that answers our first question, um, because it, the first question was, with many present and growing problems with nuclear threats, what, if anything, can average citizens do to encourage positive change? Um, how about, um, let's see, give me a second here. 
So this is uh, Congressman for Foster for you. Um, given the lack of physicists in Congress, how can we get more experts into Congress? Are there things that you would recommend? Any changes we need to make, or experts just need to raise their hand and run for office? Well, it's a it's a tough you know meat grinder that you have to put yourself through to run for office. You know the the you know the often mentioned highest hurdle of having to um, raise a large amount of money for your campaigns is a real. Um, you know, it's a real problem. You know, I spend a fair amount of my time trying to recruit other scientists to run for office, and very often you get all the way through the discussion where they say, okay, I've had, I've had the discussion with my, my spouse, and I can take a one-year sabbatical because you have to at least have enough money to take a year off of, you know, without getting a paycheck. <laughs> um, and so that, and, but then when they look at the reality of what you have to do with your time to raise money, it's very hard to get a really competent person willing to spend a large amount of their life that way. So it's one of the, the worst things about our, our, um, our system right now. It, it makes it much less of a meritocracy than it could be because you have this filter that says only people willing to, to do that you know, really have a realistic chance. And this is, um, yeah, th that's tough. On the other hand, um, you know, there's this question that everyone has to ask themselves of what fraction of your life you spend in service to your fellow man. And uh, you know, it turns out science is no help at all with answering that question. But, but you know, in the end, it's something everyone has to answer. And you know, public service and, and elected office is one of the highest leverage uses of your time with whatever fraction of your life you decide to spend in service to your fellow man. So here's, this is a question that tries to pull together things that we've talked about. Maybe gives you an opportunity to think of some uh, summary takeaways. Um, if this is a, a mini, if we're in a kind of mini Cold War situation with North Korea and others, what can what can the Cold War teach us today? So, what are some of the lessons learned from then that are actually applicable to the situation we find ourselves in now? That's probably to each of you to kind of think through. So, I'd, I'll. I'll start and say deterrence works. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the lessons of the Cold War. Um, and one of the things we've got to think about is um, if we're n not able to uh, convince Kim Jong-un not to go down this road, the um, next question becomes how do we deter? Uh, and, and there's, I believe that the Cold War teaches answers to that. I think the other thing the Cold War teaches you is that, it, is that you have to talk to the other side. Um, and, 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 and you have to understand their, 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 the reasons they're doing this. Um, and if you can't talk to them, you can't get anywhere. So uh, I think that's critically important. Those are the two lessons I would apply here. Yeah, I, I would say that there, there's a lesson which is kind of a not an anti-lesson that the Cold War ta taught us, which is that uh, because deterrence works, the question is, would deterrence ever work for non-state actors? And the answer is probably no. That's the scary part. Because we've talked earlier uh, this evening about non-state actors. And we know that the non-state actors that, for example, would be willing to die to get access to what, we, what usually, traditionally, has been thought of, uh, of material too hot to handle, literally too hot to handle. There are folks that probably are willing to do that. So that's the scary part. Um, I, I draw lessons not so much from the Cold War, but uh, if you look at cybersecurity and computer viruses, almost everything bad that can be done with computer viruses has been done. And so when you think about bioterror, for example, for which you, know, you can detect a nuclear, um, you know, the facility to build a nuclear bomb can be seen by sa satellites. That's not true of a bioterror lab, and the threshold for that just dropping and dropping and dropping. And so this is you know, one of the things that keeps me up at night, um, that all this stuff is out there on the internet. The whole biohacking thing is you know, not that different. And um, it's a, we just, this is, every generation has to engage on this. I, am, I think there is, our, our democracy, and I think people generally don't do well at dealing with tail risk. Uh, that, you know, you never, um, Barney Frank, with whom I served on the Financial Services Committee, said it's almost impossible to get credit in politics for disasters averted. <laughs> and I think that is fundamental. This is, you know, if you just increase bank capital requirements so that we don't have a crisis, everyone yells at you for, you know, slowing down economic growth. 
and this is, that's, I guess, the nature of things, but you have to recognize it and lean against that tendency. So this picks up, this question picks up on that, and Mike, it's, it's directed uh, to you. What certainty do we have that weapons-grade materials are not already in the hands of terrorists? Well, we don't know, right? I mean, we don't know for sure. Um, there's, there's not many things that, that I know um, with, with certainty, and that's certainly one of them. Um, you know, we, we, we do have pretty good intelligence access to terrorist groups. Um, it's been worked ex very, very hard, as you can imagine, since 9-11. Since um, so that gives me some confidence. Um, also, I could not agree more that if, if they got their hands on it, they would use it. Um, no doubt in my mind. Um, so um, I'd say I'm 95% certain that, that a terrorist organization does not have their hands on fissile material at the moment. So this goes back up to state actors that we haven't talked about China very much. Um, and so what is the role and impact of China on the current nuclear landscape? I might look at Bob, because he's coming back from South Korea, yeah. so clearly some of your conversation must have included right. China. Uh, it and did. Um, so uh, uh, in the South Korean context, uh, there are two different issues. One of them is that uh, China has been positioning itself to uh, become a, a reactor exporter. They don't really yet do that, but they're certain positioning themselves to do it. And if the Koreans... Um, uh, really do uh, get out of the nuclear business. Basically, there will be two countries in the world that will be active, actively selling nuclear reactors. And it's interesting that those two countries will be China and Russia, not a single Western country. Um, uh, going back to the, uh, the uh, missile defense uh, uh, issue, uh, of course, uh, the Chinese, you can imagine, don't particularly appreciate us putting theater uh, anti-missile uh, defenses in South Korea, which is what we're doing. What worries you about um, China's export of nuclear technology? They don't have an interest in spreading this around. They, so they're trying to figure out how to um, export civilian nuclear power technologies. Mm -hmm. They have no interest in recreating another North Korea. Why are you worried about it? Um, I think they see it as... Um, uh, they, they're quite rational about these things. I mean, if anything, they're really, uh, uh, they think for the long haul. And uh, my sense is that uh, they have decided that uh, they, they will get out of the coal business uh, this century, and it will be replaced by some combination of nuclear and renewables of some sort. And uh, since they will be able to take advantage of uh, the advantage of scale, because uh, they're going to be building lots of reactors. They're building 20 reactors right now. Um, they'll be world-beating in terms of price on, on the export market. Of course, the unknown is, is uh, whether or not in 20, 30, 40 years anyone will want nuclear reactors. We, that's not, we don't know that. But they're certainly betting that the answer is yes. Mike, what, what's your... Re uh, answer to that question of China's role, and I'd love to get your thoughts. Would you worry about China being a, a exporter of nuclear technology for civilian energies? No, I wouldn't at all. I mean, I, I, they're not going to proliferate the kind of technologies that that should worry us. Um, on on North Korea, they are um, they they have very large strategic interests here. Um, Strategic interest number one is that they understand better than anybody what the downsides are for them of North Korea having um, nuclear weapons and the ability to deliver them. Um, they understand that that will likely lead the South Koreans to go down the nuclear weapons route. Um, they understand that that, oh, that will get the Japanese to at least think about it. They understand what it means for missile defense in not only South Korea, but Japan and um, Guam. Um, they, understand, they understand all of that, right? They understand the amount of American force structure that's gonna be 
put in East Asia to protect ourselves from North Korea. Um, they get all of that. Um, they also understand the military risks that this creates, and that's not in their interest. Um, on the other hand, right, they, they, they worry deeply that, that them using their leverage to squeeze Kim Jong-un around the neck to try to get him to change his behavior risks a collapse of the regime. And in that risk of a collapse of the regime, they fear three things. They fear the one you hear the most, um, but it, it's actually the least important, is the hundreds of thousands of refugees coming across their border from North Korea into China. They also fear, um, in a collapse scenario, loose nuclear weapons in North Korea. Nobody in charge, nobody with control over the nuclear weapons. Um, and then the thing they fear absolutely the most, and they will simply never allow to happen, is a united Korea allied with the United States on their border. Um, and so they're, 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 they're pulled in two different directions here. Um, it would seem to me that it would be extraordinarily wise to be having behind the scenes, not public, conversations with the Chinese um, that are based on mutual respect about how should we together, the United States and China together, deal with this problem of North Korea and that we shouldn't be subtly threatening China um, with conducting military operations against North Korea. Um, part of what we're doing is trying to intimidate the Chinese into action, which, which, which is not the way to get the Chinese to play, or to subtly threaten them with, if you don't play on North Korea, we're going to come after you on trade. Right? That is not the way to deal with the Chinese. And the way to deal with them is to go sit down with them in Beijing and have a conversation about our joint strategic interests here and how do we work together. Um, it's not only an opportunity to, 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 to deal successfully with North Korea, but it's an opportunity to set the stage for a future U.S.-China relationship where we actually work together on these issues rather than apart. Bill. I think there's, and I was disappointed to, at least to my ability to, to learn things, that the Chinese have basically refused to engage on any discussion of what happens the day after, you know, a military uh, event. You know, the, I'm confident the U.S. would be willing to, you know, agree to all kinds of limitations to where U.S. forces end up inside, um, you know, whatever form of Korea survives that. But the reason that we have to be talking about it, and the Chinese, I understand, refuse to discuss it because they think that increases the probability that the U.S. might try something militarily. On the other hand, the, my biggest fear in this whole situation we're in is that there's going to be an assassination attempt, successful or not, that will be interpreted as a decapitating strike, and that there will be in place teams of fanatics who's under orders to go pull the trigger if their leader is dies for any um, you know artificial reason, and this that you know the odds are not zero that that could happen any time, and the fact that we do not have contingency planning with the um, you know, with the Chinese is really scary to me. Can I just say one more thing about China? So when the rhetoric, when the rhetoric was at its hottest between Kim Jong-un and President Trump a month ago, although it's getting there again, um, the Chinese came out publicly and they said two things. First thing they said was, if the United States preemptively attacks North Korea, um, we will fight on behalf of North Korea. And then the second thing they said was, if North Korea starts something militarily, they're on their own. So this was China trying to deter both of us. This was, in my view, China being the adult in the room. Right. You know, this was this was a role the United States of America used to play. Yeah. Um, here, the Chinese are playing it. Yeah. What's the panel's view in terms of strategic stability? How much do we need? nuclear weapons to deter others from using it against us? And can we continue to reduce um, our nuclear arsenals given that we might need them? Who wants to take that one? Who wants to talk about mutually assured destruction? I'm, I'm willing to take a shot at it. Um, so it, so there, there, uh, there certainly has been a growing movement uh, for going to zero. And of course, uh, President Obama's uh, 
really famous and wonderful Prague talk was all about that. Um, but in the final analysis, the, the issue has always been coming up with a plan of how you get there. And this has bedeviled all attempts at disarmament from the beginning of the discussions in the 1950s, which is to figure out a route to get to zero that deals with the problem of misbehavior, of cheating. And one of the issues, of course, is that uh, when we talk about the reductions of nuclear weapons, the strategic weapons, we're really only talking about the ones that, if you like, are on duty, the ones that are deployed. So those are not only 1,500 on our side, 1,500 on the Russian side. But now you can ask, well, how many are there actually not deployed? Well, an order of magnitude or more than that. They're in storage somewhere. And the obvious question is, how do you in ensure that these things really disappear? And I think no one really has a good, good answer to that question. That, that's the real conundrum in my mind, that coming up with a, a, with a plan that really guards against misbehavior is very, very challenging. And nobody's figured it out. And if you imagine a, um, you know, a, a scenario where somehow magically everyone gradually reduces their, um, you know, their arsenals, um, there, there's a, a point that you get to where the numbers are small, where they're no longer existence threatening. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I find it, for example, hard to imagine a future Israel that will give up its last few nuclear weapons. It just, you know, that's, I, you know, because of the real dangers they face, I think that's probably the reality. Um, I, it'd be hard to, for us to give up our last few nuclear weapons. But still, if you can get to a point where at least worst case scenario does not obliterate all mankind, you've made a heck of an improvement in, you know, in the outlook for humanity. I, so I, I think that should be what we should focus on more than zero, because the last, yeah. Not gonna happen. Yeah. I don't know why I thought of this, but I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Um, if you were to make a list of the national security interests of the United States, at the top of the list would be the preservation of the nation, right? And, and as I think about, as I think about uh, the risks, the existential risks to the nation, right? I only see three. I see nuclear war between the United States and Russia. I see a uh, naturally occurring or man-made biological agent that kills millions and millions and millions of Americans. Um, and I see climate change. Mm -hmm. um, and you need, to have a, you need to have a briefing on AI. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe, maybe I need to think about adding that to the list. But uh, there's a tremendous amount of work right on the first for decades. There's very little work being done on two. And there's very little work being done on three. Right. And little work being done on your fourth, perhaps. Well, that, that is a tough one. It's yeah. yeah, it's one of these things like bioterror, where the footprint is so small um, for you know cyber attacks or bioterror. So the last question raises us up and probably gets us to the kind of conversation that the university organizers would like us to to finish on, which is and it's addressed to all three of you, which is what other issues facing the U.S. today would benefit from a Manhattan Project like big science approach. I'd love to start that one off. Um, it's one of the issues uh, that we just mentioned, which is climate change. Um, both from the point of view of thinking through how to replace and replace the existing uh, energy infrastructure, the one that is basically fossil-based, uh, to improve the efficiency with which we deliver power. Um, and then finally, since I, I, I my own fear is that we've, we've passed the point in terms of carbon loading of the atmosphere where we're not going to see a, a serious effects. I think we're well past that point. Uh, thinking through how uh, we actually deal with the response to climate change, adaptation. And those are all uh, issues that will require a lot of money on the research end and then finally on the deployment end. None of these things will be cheap. I, I think that's a... It's a great example. But it requires the, 
the body politic to finally accept the fact that there is human-caused climate change, and we're not there yet. I'm pleased to say that we had a cover story of that in 1970s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it, so is unanimity around climate change, or is there other things we should also be talking about that would, could, could benefit from kind of this big science approach? Well, I, I think the, our economy is about to be transformed by, um, you know, AI robots building robots, which are an exponential technology. And you are going to have to completely rethink our economy. Uh, you know, the, everyone's kind of familiar with the, the old science fiction story about one person who owns the robot factory and no one can compete in any job with the robots built by the robots in its factory. <laughs> and, you know, we're within spitting distance of that. You know. And, uh, and you can see our economy already straining uh, under the, the effects of that. If you just look at the, the stress of, of retail um, under the, the stress due to Amazon, which is basically you know, the, the robots in the Amazon distribution centers and their websites replacing retail jobs, that this is really, I think, the economic and political challenge of our generation. I think it's already distorting U.S. politics and world politics, for that matter. And uh, it's, it's a big deal, and we have to rethink uh, fundamentally our economy, both internationally and inside our country. And is, is your uh, primary focus on that the, uh, the unemployment or the underemployment that's going to come by from artificial intelligence, or are you worried about, um, on, a, on a, a military sense, how these wars are going to be fought? What, uh, what that, that's another one, yeah. The, if you Google lethal autonomous weapon systems, Mm -hmm. You're led to a very interesting video by Stuart Russell, who's the guy that wrote the book on AI that essentially everyone uses. And so watch that video and then think about what you do about you know, small drones programmed with facial recognition to go and land on your head and go boom. It's a, you know, this is a, um, you know, th this is a, and you've been having some of this in the bulletin because this is, uh, you know, the Pentagon is onto this and we're seeing that ISIS is using you know, a very low-tech application of drones. And when you add artificial intelligence, facial recognition, all that into the mix, and the tremendously low cost of this technology, it's, it, you know, it's going to be transformative. This is not a physical sciences answer to the question. It's a social science answer. So people, people always ask me in fora like this, you know, what, what, what's your number one concern? What keeps you up at night, blah, blah, blah. Right? And when I, was, when I was the deputy director of CIA, I would always answer that with an intelligence um, answer. Right? I would say terrorists with nuclear weapons. And, and, and that does, that, that, that continues to, to, to scare me to death. Um, but, but, but what really keeps me up at night um, is the failure of our politics to come together as Democrats and Republicans to compromise and solve all of the problems that we have as a society, these two included, right, um, and to make the decisions that are necessary to push our economy and our society forward. Because at the end of the day, the most important determinant of a country's national security is the health of its economy and its society. Um, everything else pales in comparison long term. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of reasons why our politics are the way they are. I'm sure the congressman can, can, can speak eloquently about this for, for quite some time. Um, you know, from, from the 24-hour news cycle to Citizens United to, to all sorts of things. Um, but if we don't get our arms around that, we don't get our arms around anything. So I think one of the concluding thoughts from this too and tying it back to the video that we saw in the beginning is um, when when we're able to marry kind of research and government funding towards an end, there's almost nothing that we can't do. But when we can't do this because we can't politically define our priorities and come together to achieve them, we're, um, we're really straightjacketed. So the charge for all of us is to continue to work on how to figure out how we as voters can make our politics better. And the answers aren't clear or out there, but we certainly have to figure that out. So with that, I want to thank the University of Chicago again for kicking off this nuclear reaction. Darren, I think I'll turn it back over to you. Let me just extend my thanks back to Rachel Bronson, Michael Morell, Congressman Foster, and Professor Rosner for what was an enlightening 
launch to the nuclear reactions commemoration just would uh, ask you to give them all a round of applause. <laughs>